All right, Doug, are you ready to get going? I think so. I'll keep letting folks in while you intro and then uh, you can hand it over to me. Great, excellent. Well, thank you everyone for coming and taking the time to attend today's training. I'm Stephanie Dahlberg here with the Bureau of Housing Supports at the Department of Health and Human Services. I'm also the co-chair of the Balance of State Continuum of Care Coordinated Entry Subcommittee. The Balance of State Continuum of Care is sponsoring and hosting this training series with continued communication and collaboration with our other two continuums of care, Greater Nashua and Manchester. We're here today to talk about the roles and responsibilities within the New Hampshire coordinated entry system. This training was developed and will be presented by the Technical Assistance Collaborative. The training will be an overview of roles and responsibilities, understanding there may be some funding specific requirements and details that aren't fully touched upon during the session. Our following sessions will give more in-depth information for what's required for each grant, but we will touch on some of it today. I also wanted to point out that there are a couple of distinctions when we're talking about coordinated entry. So there's the coordinated entry system, which is the main focus of our training series. But there's also the coordinated entry grant that's funded through HUD and the coordinated entry project in HMIS for data. So again, we're really focusing on the coordinated entry system, which incorporates people from all different sorts of backgrounds, um, don't necessarily need to be funded for housing projects. Um, we're looking at the whole system here, but we will touch on the other pieces that are part of it. We appreciate you taking the time to be here with us. And uh, you may have seen in the chat, we do have a link for sign-in. If for some reason you can't access that, you can email me and my email is also in the chat. And with that, I'll pass it over to our presenter, Doug. Thanks, Stephanie. And uh, Stephanie, if you could take a, a keep an eye on the participant um, list coming in if folks, if you can let them into the room, that would be great. Um, Welcome back, everybody. We are recording this and the slides will be available. Uh, we also anticipate questions coming up today. Uh, the overview that we're going to discuss uh, is probably information that you've seen in different places. Um, and so we're trying to kind of uh, get that all into the same place and um, talk about some of the uh, various uh, roles and responsibilities based on the type of partnerships that exist within New Hampshire's court entry process uh, across the state. Um, my name is Doug Tatro. I'm with the Technical Assistance Collaborative. We are a uh, TA and training provider that uh, is based out of Boston. Uh, we're we're uh, hired by HUD and VA in states and localities to assist with uh, homeless services and design. I'm actually based in New Hampshire. I live in New Hampshire, which is nice because we do work in different parts of the country and I have an opportunity to work in my home state in this regard. So today uh, we're, we have a 90 minute session scheduled with some time that we're hoping to reserve for the end for questions. Um, you can feel free to use the chat for questions that are popping up uh, so that Stephanie and her counterparts can take a look at those uh, throughout the presentation. I'll also ask uh, Stephanie or others uh, if, if they need to chime in or clarify anything that I review uh, because this is specific to uh, your system um, and uh, there may be some nuances that need to be uh, added in here or there or we can get to those at the closing. Um, first things first, uh, please feel free to fill, uh, to click that Google link in the chat uh, to let us know who is here. That will be the attendance of record for this training. Um, you can put your name in the chat as well, but that will not be recorded as, as attendance. Um, what we're gonna do today is uh, first go over very briefly a couple of slides that we discussed in our first session last month around what is coordinated entry overall. Uh, that will be a very brief recap uh, for everybody in case you missed last session. If you did miss the last session, the recording uh, should have been made available. And if not, we can get it to you because um, I think that session is really important just sort of level setting for everyone to have a, a, a good foundation for what we're talking about when we talk about coordinated entry in homeless response systems. And then we're gonna talk more specifically about the responsibilities and the timelines associated with those responsibilities for the different types of partners uh, on the phone, whether you're an assessment partner or a housing provider or shelter provider. Um, uh, some of you will be all of those, some of you, none of them, um, but we'll talk a little bit about that. And then if time at the end, certainly we'll have questions and we are recording uh, the chat as well. So if there are questions that can't be answered, 
or that the uh, folks in leadership need to go back and, and discuss, we can, we can follow up uh, at a later date on those. So um, as a general sort of lead into how uh, the responsibilities operate here in the state of New Hampshire, we just wanted to give a very brief recap of some of the information that we went over in our first session last month. Um, you know, what is a continuum of care? So a continuum of care, uh, the idea of the continuum of care was first established uh, by HUD in the HEART Act, and, it, and there are minimum requirements for how continuums of care are structured, how they're governed, and how collaboration between COC funded projects, so projects that are funded under uh, HUD's annual NOFA for the COC program, and the emergency solution grant projects are uh, managed and coordinated um, uh, to create a system that is designed to most effectively and efficiently address the needs of homeless individuals and families within the geography. Uh, so the COC is really this, this compilation of all stakeholders uh, who are interested in ending homelessness within a given community. And I think some of you, uh, if not many of you, are service providers that may not even receive HUD funding. And so the question about whether or not you're part of the COC comes up. And from HUD's perspective, and I think the perspective of what we're trying to accomplish here is that while HUD only uh, requires that uh, HUD funded projects participate in this continuum of care process, the ideal uh, world is that all service providers, housing providers, outreach providers within a given geography and in the state across New Hampshire uh, are working under sort of the same set of parameters and policies uh, so that those services can be integrated uh, as best as possible. So this includes uh, all of you on the phone uh, would be part of what we might consider this, this group of interested stakeholders, uh, representatives from relevant organizations uh, across the spectrum of services for homeless or at-risk individuals and families. So when we are talking about the COC, many of you uh, and some of you may think, well, the COC is the state or the COC is this entity in Manchester or Nashua that runs the show. When in reality, uh, what HUD is trying to achieve and what and, and by um, by, you know, the sort of extension we are is a system where the stakeholders like yourselves are contributing your expertise, your services, um, uh, uh, your priorities uh, to shape how planning and action is done relevant to homeless services throughout the geography. So the COC uh, is that full body of stakeholders. And while there are leadership structures in place and entities that are doing more of the day-to-day -day work or uh, you know, putting pen to paper more often, uh, all of you uh, are empowered to be part of this continuum process and in informing the strategies and priorities that the COC is undertaking. And there are three continuums in the state of New Hampshire. There's Manchester, Greater Nashua, and the balance of state. We're gonna to talk today sort of uh, about those three COCs kind of operating under one kind of general umbrella, but there are distinctions amongst them uh, and the nuance of that we can get into at a later date. But uh, you are all part of, of that continuum of care uh, planning body. Uh, and the COC as a whole, often designated through leadership, um, has some primary functions that basically to operate uh, the overall system for homeless services within a geography. Uh, to ensure that there is a designated HMIS lead and HMIS implementation for the entire geography, and to conduct the planning conversations and uh, action steps to uh, uh, employ strategies that are most effective in trying to get toward that goal of ending homelessness. Uh, one of the primary operating sort of duties of the continuum of care is to est establish what we call a coordinated entry system. And as Stephanie alluded to, there are different um, buckets of terminology that we might use uh, to talk about coordinated uh, assessment. Um, there are the coordinated assessment uh, or coordinated entry grants, which are specific funds from HUD that go through what we call your collaborative applicant to operate coordinated entry processes. There are HMIS data elements relative to coordinated entry. But by and large, what we're trying to do is uh, and, and within the context of this training, uh, stand up a system where we are able to identify those households who have the greatest level of vulnerability, uh, who are in uh, uh, sort of uh, most risk of uh, either continued homelessness or of bodily harm or death or 
that experience in homelessness and make sure that our, our resources and our efforts are targeted uh, toward uh, those households who may have that higher level of vulnerability while also coordinating services, referrals, and uh, lighter touch interventions for those who may not qualify for or may not be able to access a longer term, say, permanent supportive housing voucher or rapid rehousing voucher, but we are working in a coordinated way as across the system. Um, so part of the requirement is that a continuum of care, that larger group of stakeholders that many of you or all of you represent, is establishing a coordinated assessment system that provides this uh, initial and ongoing assessment of needs for individuals and families that covers the full geography and that is really accessible, uh, proactively accessible to individuals and families that may be seeking assistance or need assistance. And uh, when we talk about coordinated entry and assessment, uh, this is not just a tool, but, but in fact a process that employs different types of tools and interventions that are meant to uh, divert folks or prevent them from becoming homeless, providing initial emergency services if they do become homeless, triaging uh, individuals uh, of varying needs to resources that may meet those needs or that they may need, but also recognizing that we are in a finite resource environment. And even with all of the infusion of resources coming out of the COVID stimulus bills, uh, we still operate in an environment where the, the uh, amount of uh, particularly longer term intensive assistance like permanent supportive housing combined with a lack of affordable housing uh, constrains how how many households who may need that level of assistance we can actually have access it. So coordinated assessment allows us uh, and empowers us to try to uh, work with folks at, at varying uh, needs and goals within their housing uh, uh, path and, and stability to try to link them with a resource or uh, some sort of service that gets them to exit homelessness as quickly as possible while recognizing that those who are uh, most vulnerable, who have been homeless the longest, who have the highest level of disabilities or housing barriers are those that we need to target our more finite resources to. And that is the impetus behind uh, requiring this, this assessment system. So this is meant to be a system-wide uh, approach uh, where we're employing these different types of uh, interventions uh, as a whole. So from prevention to diversion and problem solving and other creative approaches to making sure that our programs are operating within the flexibility that they have and using uh, shorter term interventions like rapid rehousing to supplement where we have pitfalls in our permanent supportive housing portfolio, making sure that uh, we're not continuing to use a first come first serve approach um, we have used first term, first come first serve approaches for a long time in homeless services, and that is inherently inequitable and wasteful in terms of the finite resources that we do have to work with. And what we're trying to do is create what we might consider to be a, a, an emergency room triage where uh, if somebody comes in with a broken arm under a first come first serve approach, they are going to be served immediately, even if someone five minutes later comes in with significant head trauma. What we need to reorient our system to be in this emergency response is making sure that the person with head trauma, the person most likely to suffer the most adverse effects based on their unique vulnerability in the moment is served in a way that uh, reflects not, not the timing by which they entered our system, but the vulnerability that exists in their lives uh, and, and their morbidity toward uh, uh, as a result of their homelessness. So um, our uh, coordinated entry process as a whole he tries to reorient our system uh, to be client driven, to be housing first, to employ uh, client choice, um, but also to recognize that there are some households for whom homelessness is far more dangerous and or uh, 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 far more prolonged uh, without access to our services than other folks uh, uh, may see. So this is a generic um, uh, you know, uh, screen of what a coordinated uh, system looks like, where we have folks who are living in the community uh, in housing, uh, some may be doubled up, some may have their own housing. Uh, with COVID, we saw uh, a changing dynamic and who was losing uh, income and therefore losing their jobs. There is a coordinated entry access process, and we're gonna talk about some of those points today, where diversion and problem solving is employed, and we're looking to find ways to have folks avoid that literal homelessness, even if that is uh, less than ideal, as long as it is safe. Um, 
looking for ways to reduce the trauma of folks actually having to live on the streets or in shelter or their cars or the woods and trying to find alternatives uh, where those alternatives can't be immediately identified. We're ensuring that linkage to the emergency sh uh, shelter or services and then beginning and continuing to assess those households and working with them to understand their goals and needs uh, based on their, uh, their own sort of um, uh, glide path out of homelessness to connect them with a resource that may be uh, available to them that can end that homelessness. The reality again, is that um, there are many people in the state of New Hampshire for whom uh, a resource will not be available due to uh, the lack of, uh, of, of enough resources. And we need to continue to employ these more creative solutions uh, as we go along to try to uh, find other ways that we can help people mediate or uh, navigate their ways out of their homeless crisis, knowing that many of the longer term resources are occupied by folks who have been um, uh, either in, in instability or homelessness for quite some time. So these are the core elements that we're going to talk about uh, over this training series that we started to introduce uh, last time. Um, uh, access to uh, the overall system so we can't help people that we don't know are there and it's not their job to find us, it's ours to find them. Assessment, which is not a single tool, but a process that allows us to understand the unique goals, desires, and needs of an individual household or family uh, in order to link them to what resource may be available and appropriate to them. Recognizing that we have a finite resource environment and while many households may need uh, rapid rehousing or may need permanent supportive housing. We may not have enough of those resources, so we have to further prioritize based on the vulnerability of the population that we're serving. And then referral, uh, making sure that as folks are prioritized for a given housing slot or enrollment, that we are uh, seamlessly moving people toward that provider or that enrollment to get them off the street in, back into housing and hopefully back into some level of stability in their life. So the rest of this, that was my brief recap entry overall for those that you, of you that missed it or uh, needed that refresher from last month. Uh, the rest of this presentation is going to talk more about the New Hampshire coordinated entry roles and responsibilities uh, that are laid out uh, within um, the court entry manual and some of the uh, partnership agreements that have come out. I would encourage folks to uh, use that chat for questions as you need it, um, or you can follow up with us later. Um, but we're going to dive into that uh, here. So some high level points. Stephanie mentioned that uh, coordinated entry and many of you may not be uh, uh, funded by HUD. There is no requirement, regulatory or otherwise, that if you do not receive HUD or VA funding, because the SSDF program and HUD BASH programs and GPD do require use of coordinated entry as well. Um, but if you're not funded by these federal homeless resources, you may not be mandated to participate in the coordinate entry process overall. But the state of New Hampshire and the three COCs uh, within it are committed to working with all types of providers, whether you're funded by HUD or not, to try to integrate our services in a way that brings that system level approach with common goals, common practices, and common protocol for how people move from uh, a level of homelessness or housing instability toward uh, hopefully uh, uh, not being homeless anymore, whether that requires a longer term resource or not. You also may be a provider that wants to participate in coordinate entry, but you don't have the capacity to complete all of these expectations that we're going to talk about throughout this presentation. And uh, from the balance of state, state perspective, uh, certainly, you know, the state is willing to work with any provider, whether you're a small shelter or a transitional housing project, or you provide affordable housing uh, that primarily goes toward people who have experienced homelessness, or you're doing outreach services through a faith-based organization, Whatever it may be, you may be very constrained in, in your capacity to meet, you know, data entry, data entry or timeliness needs. Uh, but that does not mean you can't be a partner in this work. And uh, so we would encourage folks to continue to the dialogue with your continuum of care leads, with uh, the state and the balance of state, for instance, um, to figure out where you might fit a niche and where your services uh, may be able to complement. Uh, what's happening within the, the sort of formal court entry process and where the formal court entry process can help complement the services that you're striving to deliver to your clients. We also uh, want to make sure that it's exceptionally clear that coordinated entry fully embraces client choice. So the idea here is not that we are dictating the type of housing, the location of the housing, 
uh, with whom people live in that housing uh, in order for people to access services. If there are folks that uh, are unwilling to provide information or documentation, that does not preclude a household from being part of this overall service delivery system. It may delay in some respects the housing options that exist because there are certain uh, documents and, and uh, personal information that needs to be disclosed for enrollment. But we are uh, always looking not to, um, sorry, one second, I gotta put another headphone in. Um, we are not, Stephanie, can you still hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, that we are not um, looking to dictate that, but we are using uh, the, the client's choice as part of what informs us and in how we make these referrals. So uh, for a long time, we've run programs, right? And frankly, many of you uh, uh, are still running programs that are not integrated into a system. And what we've done for decades now is we've run uh, programs that are disconnected from the larger goals in, in a given community, and we haven't ended homelessness. And that's not the only reason we have an affordable housing crisis. We have a pandemic. We have uh, the same level funding every year for higher costs. But um, the way in which we've seen community level goals be achieved is when we work as a system and work within a coordinated approach to allow each of our skill sets, each of our expertise, each of our project design to uh, be uh, consistent with uh, the larger goals at hand and to meet the niche that you may you may have as a given uh, a given expertise or different or different project type. So we have to adapt. We need to stop thinking about households as our client, but it, I'm sorry, my client instead our client. Um, we have to start realizing that uh, across a community, there is so much good work happening that it often uh, can get muddled in a way that becomes duplicative and uh, uh, counterproductive when we're all trying to do the same thing at once and we're missing key gaps and maybe missing key services for, for folks. So the goal here beyond HUD's sort of overall requirement and, you know, the, the typical federal regulatory, you know, language that comes out when these laws are written is that we're trying to create a homeless crisis response system that can be best meet the needs of the local population that need those services while also doing that with the, with the optimal amount of efficiency that we can, uh, again, as a community of practitioners. So that is our goal. Um, so what we're gonna do for a little bit, and Stephanie, feel free, if there are questions, if you want me to pause, I'm happy to. I can't um, look at the chat while I'm speaking. Um, Don't worry, I'll flag I, you down. I do see some flashing. All right, you can go ahead and flag me down, thank you. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about the different roles that are articulated as part of the court entry guidebook and the partnership agreements that have, that have been put in place and that many have seen, um, starting with the coordinated entry lead. This is the entity that some of you may call the COC, uh, and I don't really care what you call it, but just for distinction, um, the coordinated entry lead uh, is um, a specifically funded or operated entity that is responsible for facilitating and managing the coordinated entry system within your specific geography. So you can see down below the three New Hampshire COCs. So for uh, Manchester, there's a coordinated entry committee that is convened by the continuum of care and uh, its governance charter. In Greater Nashua, uh, Harbor Care is your coordinated entry lead. And then for the rest of the state outside of the Greater Nashua COC and Manchester COCs, the balance of state, uh, as it's called, the New Hampshire Department of Housing Supports uh, is uh, your court entry lead. So the state assumes that responsibility and they are also the collaborative applicant. These entities in general are the ones that are responsible uh, for uh, the ultimate matching of applicants based on their assessment, based on their trajectory and eligibility to the available uh, prioritized housing providers that have openings. Um, they also are going to be maintaining and updating the regional access points, some of the inventory lists, uh, sending out updates, providing training and support. So your coordinated entry lead uh, uh, is really um, a uh, navigation sort of role, uh, both for the end result of the housing referral from prioritization, but also in terms of bringing together groups like this to work toward policies, protocols, and priorities that, uh, that are meeting the community's needs. And so there's a convening power relevant to the process of how someone goes from becoming homeless 
or at risk of homelessness to either avoiding that homelessness altogether or uh, being rehoused, whether through a dedicated resource or not. So in this context, the, the court entry lead is really focused on that local prioritization list, the, the list of folks for whom an assessment has been conducted, diversion and problem solving efforts have been made and have not been successful. The household has now uh, is now in homelessness, is unable to escape homelessness on their own, or at least uh, for what we know at the moment. And uh, there are uh, housing providers and openings that are opening up. And the court entry lead is making that linkage uh, from that list of those individuals who are prioritized uh, to the available housing for which they are uh, both appropriate and eligible for. So those are your court entry leads. Um, they uh, are also here for that training and support. So this, this discussion here is being uh, hosted by um, the New Hampshire uh, Housing uh, uh, Bureau of Housing Supports uh, under Stephanie's leadership and others. Uh, I'm helping out a little bit here too as the presenter. Um, but they are a, a convening entity and a coordinating entity as much as they are uh, also playing that administrative role of uh, developing policies and procedures, making sure that the roles are clarified for different partners and things of the like. So uh, that is your court entry lead. We're going to go amongst the different partnerships now, uh, who you are, uh, what your general responsibilities are as part of that partnership. And for those of you who are not part of any formal agreement in, within coordinated entry, maybe wondering, you know, what does all this mean? We're going to get into a little bit more of the detail now. So one of the first uh, uh, and largest sets of partners that we have uh, here are our referral partners. And that's how we're going to refer to you as referral partners. You are individuals that are able to make those referrals. Uh, the list is here. I'm not going to read all of these. But if you're from any one of the organizations listed on the screen at the moment, uh, the next uh, you know, seven or so minutes of the slides will apply to you. Uh, and this is these are uh, folks that have signed on to or committed uh, to being what we're calling a referral partner within the coordinated entry process. So if you see your 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 name here, the slides will go out. If you if you can't read it fast enough, uh, the next slides uh, uh, apply very specifically to you. But everybody should be listening because again, we're creating a full system, and we need to understand how different parts of the system work. So the primary role of the referral partner. Uh, is uh, someone who is referring or connecting households with the regional access points and assessment partners. So you may attend case conferencing sessions, uh, but you could be a hospital. We saw some SAUs listed, schools, uh, community organizations, other providers that may not have HMIS access. Uh, for those of you uh, out there, HMIS is the Homeless Management Information System. It is the central database for how we manage homeless services and data uh, throughout the continuums coffee shops, uh, really any community provider uh, that may encounter or uh, interact with um, homeless or at-risk individuals who may need to be referred into or to provide information on how to access some of these service uh, centers, like your regional access points, and where those assessments for the longer-term housing needs take place. So, uh, uh, there may be a, 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 an immediate referral to 201 or a local assessment partner who we're going to describe in a couple of minutes as soon as you interact. So this could be casual interaction. This could be in the community uh, folks that are, uh, you can see here, coffee shops. Maybe there are places within the community where people who are in experiencing homelessness are frequenting. And these partners now have the tool or the knowledge that they need to be able to uh, uh, provide information for that folks or referral to that folks to then connect them with the larger formal system of coordinated entry and homeless services. So some referral partners will also be uh, homeless service providers if you're on uh, the list that we showed here. But you can see many of these providers and partners are uh, uh, entities that may exist on the peripheral of the homeless service system, right? So hospitals, uh, 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 cities, the VA, um, other types of programs that uh, interact with people in the community, uh, some of whom are homeless, some are not, that are maybe the first touch point for somebody who's in crisis uh, and are trying to then connect them to a next step. For our referral partners on the line, if you're on that previous slide or if you're interested in being one, there is no data entry requirement uh, specific to coordinated entry. There is that referral to the local assessment partner or two-on-one, but these partners do not have access to that centralized database. 
Uh, it may be a soft touch or one touch type referral that is coming from a referral partner because they, they witness somebody in their restaurant or in the school who has uh, clearly and an has uh, unstable housing situation and they're moving it into the more formal coordinated process that allows those folks to get connected to uh, any available resource that may, uh, uh, may transpire for them based on um, their assessment and eligibility. So this is sort of our uh, outer edge of our circle when it comes to bringing folks into our services. One thing that I will mention, if we have anybody who's involved in uh, uh, local YMCAs or law enforcement or other providers like that, there are a lot of people inside our communities. I live in uh, the city of Manchester. Uh, my, my stepfather uh, works downtown in an office and he uh, interacts with folks that are in downtown Manchester, uh, sometimes uh, not liking the interaction he has, but interacts quite a bit. So, you know, these downtown business districts, the local areas where folks may congregate, especially in some of our cities or, or larger towns, they can be referral partners. They may appreciate having the information they need to connect to somebody uh, who uh, it may be uh, in their area where they work or where they live. Uh, and having some sort of phone number to call or that assessment partner linkage uh, so that we're bringing people in. So one of the biggest challenges with access and coordinated entry is that a lot of people don't know where to go if they fall into homelessness or have a housing crisis. And I would say the vast majority of people uh, may, may, may know about 211, but you know, I, I live in, in Manchester and I think if I surveyed you know, five or, or 10 of my neighbors you know, what would you do if you lost your house today? I don't think very many of them would know what the response would be or where to go. And so these informal, uh, uh, but, but sort of protocol driven organizations that are referral partners are really key in reach and outreach partners for all of us to be able to make sure that anybody who may be in a housing crisis that's not being touched by shelter systems or your regional access points or the outreach teams knows that there are uh, uh, some sort of a uh, linkage to resources that may be available to them. So Why those are our referral partners. In really quick, yeah. I see a question in the chat. How are referral partners tracked to see how they're making referrals and to also provide support to those that are very active? Um, so the referral partner role, um, there's no strict requirements on this. Um, it's pretty open, but if you're referring to like how they make a referral, um, we'll get into that a bit more, but, you know, utilizing the two-in-one and uh, developing relationships with the assessment partners is going to be one of the first steps. And again, we'll get into, you know, the how on how that happens as we go further in this training and then our other uh, trainings in the series. But um, we're working on how to kind of formalize a referral process from referral partner to assessment partner. I hope that answers the question. Let me know if it doesn't. We can always circle back with that. And then our um, local partners that are required to be part of this process are working in their communities to talk to everybody about what community entry is and invite them to be referral partners. So that's how the referral partners you saw in the previous slide got connected with the system and they're invited to all these trainings and um, you know, trying to link arms together to, to make this work. Thank you, Stephanie. So uh, continue to add those questions. If you have more on that or anything that as we go along, we'll, we'll take some stops here and there and leave time at the end as well. So, so our referral partners were uh, that group of formal and informal touch points where folks are getting navigated toward that emergency response and sort of the next steps in our formal system. Our assessment partners play a really critical role. They are listed here. I think we got everybody uh, Stephanie, if you're not on this list and want to be an assessment partner, uh, more to come. Um, but we have a wide range across the state of New Hampshire of folks who are considered what we call assessment partners. And remember, assessment is a process. Uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, it's not just a single tool uh, or a single um, uh, intervention, but it is a, it is a role within the, within the community, this network of service providers that is helping us to understand who uh, uh, is in most uh, critical need of the housing interventions we have available using both tools and uh, strategies to try to do that. And we're gonna talk about that in a second. But if you are on this list, you are considered an assessment partner. It's one of the most critical roles 
within the community and within the court entry process. And so uh, uh, you can see that list here if you haven't found yourself yet or if you're not sure, we will send these slides out. But this is the current uh, formal list of assessment partners. Uh, this is really where the point of entry uh, for the formal court of entry uh, happens. Um, so you are a point of entry for applicants going into uh, uh, the court entry project via HMIS. And I'll talk more specifically about uh, the HMIS requirements in a moment. Uh, these staff in assessment uh, partnerships are trained and will be trained more uh, in the coming months on what it looks like to do coordinated, uh, ent uh, coordinated entry assessment processes, both from uh, diversion and problem solving and creative sort of navigation to the more formal assessment tools that some of you have used in the past that are being adapted a bit now. Uh, but training will be offered to all of you. Assessment partners uh, should understand that there are uh, tools that are used, but there are also skill sets and philosophies that we apply to the front door of our court entry process that we will continue to support in the state and the COCs will continue to support you all in in the coming months. So more to come on that. Um, but there are there's an expectation that as you're working with folks and doing assessment, uh, again, as a process, that there's a regular check-in with individuals that are on these prioritization lists that have gone through uh, a basic intake into HMIS, that have now gone through a longer form, more formal assessment, that there is uh, uh, ongoing sort of uh, connection with these folks, um, starting to look at what other options may be available to them if they're not going to be poised for a housing resource immediately, uh, where their document status might be, where referral status might be, other updates to their overall assessment. I would argue that as an assessment partner, one of the key tools that you have is your ability and skill set in helping people navigate toward alternative options other than being homeless, recognizing that many of the people that you're engaging with will not receive a housing subsidy anytime soon, and that we may need to be thinking more, more creatively about ways that we can help folks connect to landlords, connect to uh, uh, local job markets, or where there may be folks that may be willing to live together, and you're seeing them in your assessment process, knowing that they may not be connected to a dedicated funding source soon, but if they are willing to look for a two bedroom unit and live together uh, and that gives them uh, what they need for uh, to afford their housing. You know, this is really an engaged group uh, that, are, you know, that are proactively engaging uh, with the folks who are experiencing homelessness in the community. Uh, and they are part of the overall New Hampshire coordinated entry partnership agreement. Um, if you were on that list and you don't know what the partnership agreement is, you should probably talk to someone else internally or let Stephanie know, uh, but that is an agreement uh, that uh, outlines the roles and expectations that we're kind of reviewing here today. So the overall timeframes are uh, both uh, uh, sort of articulated, but with some flexibility. So one, uh, we need as a country, frankly, uh, to be infusing much more deliberate uh, diversion and problem solving uh, strategies into every engagement with every client that we see. Uh, just because somebody has multiple disabilities or mental health issues does not necessarily mean they don't have other support systems within their family or social structures or within the community that may help them exit homelessness uh, without needing a longer term intervention. Similarly, there may be people who present with very few housing barriers or other types of disabilities that we might um, identify who do not have other options to exit homelessness without our support. So we use diversion strategies, uh, and I know there's a diversion tool that was developed by a number of folks, uh, and including, I think, Mandy Reagan, who's on the line, uh, who would help champion that, um, that is used to try to identify whether there are alternatives to their literal homelessness tonight, whether there are other creative ways that we can help people navigate away from that uh, system, uh, where we're trying to put the emergency back in emergency housing, where uh, emergency shelter has become the new niche housing intervention in this country, which is uh, uh, terrible. Um, and we try to make sure that those folks who, are, who need shelter services, who need, you know, hotel motel, who are, are uh, coming into the system, have no other viable options. And that is an area where there is uh, training needed for, I think, a lot of folks across the country, including in New Hampshire. How do you connect with people beyond just collecting basic information and putting them in HMIS? Uh, but in fact, really uh, getting to know clients, empowering them to help you uh, identify their glide path and their pathway away from this crisis situation that they're in, 
oftentimes meeting with them on the worst day or week or month of their life and navigating that really difficult trauma inducing uh, process that that households are going through when they're coming for help. So that diversion conversation, that problem solving approach, that ability to connect with people, not in an administrative capacity, but in a, a human capacity, right? Rehumanizing the folks that we're trying to support uh, happens early at the initial um, uh, point of contact and often. Uh, it's an ongoing conversation where we're continuing to work with people to identify ways in which we might help them uh, exit homelessness with or without a longer term housing resource. Within uh, 14 days of that initial contact or initial engagement, uh, the expectation is that assessment partners are going through the more formal, <coughs> excuse me, coordinated entry process, or I'm sorry, coordinated assessment tool. Uh, the tool right now that is in place uh, came out of the COVID-19 public health crisis, which still persists and is being adapted to better reflect the needs of the community and to infuse more focus on equitable service strategies and access as well. Um, so that's where that training will come in. Uh, but within 14 days, uh, there should be uh, 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 the court entry assessment, uh, which uh, collects additional information, but also helps to prioritize folks based on their, their level of and uh, breadth of vulnerabilities and housing barriers that exist in their life. Um, the expectation is that there is that minimum weekly outreach to those that are in coordinated entry and documenting any changes of referrals or other services that are being provided, uh, that uh, you are updating um, uh, and connecting folks uh, um, if they're no longer contacted for 90 days, and also where possible, working with the client to gather supporting documentation, one, for eligibility into projects uh, in terms of you know, establishing chronic status or disability status, but also uh, trying to assist in other things like getting ID or uh, items they may need, they may need for the, for the uh, rental market, um, even if they're not items that are required by the projects that they're being funded by. So this is where HMIS becomes exceptionally important and there are some distinctions that need to be made. Um, and Stephanie, feel free to chime in here. If I, if I mess this up, I wanna make sure it's really clear. Um, there are two coordinated entry projects uh, within HMIS that serve two different functions. What we are trying to do with coordinated entry is first understand what is the total universe of people within the state of New Hampshire for whom housing instability or homelessness is present, right? Where we have a, a big picture view of all of the people who are engaging with an initial touch point service, initial engagement, seeking services or housing or in a housing crisis. So the referral coordinated entry project, uh, as it's called, is that basic data collection function that allows us to understand the total universe of folks who are experiencing crisis and seeking services within the community. Assessment partners are required to enter uh, or open that case in the referral coordinated entry project within 24 hours of the initial engagement and as soon as possible is helpful. Um, this is basic data collection that allows uh, the HMIS system to know that that household exists and where they exist and some basic information about them. Within that 14-day period, uh, you will then do a longer form assessment, which will include, uh, for those you're unable to divert, because again, we're going to continuing to try to find ways to, to find alternatives for people, uh, for those that uh, remain homeless or uh, uh, within your system, then doing that longer form assessment that includes prioritization, weighted prioritization factors and vulnerability factors. And those folks would be entered into the coordinated entry project. So there's referral to coordinated entry that creates our full universe of households for whom an initial engagement happens. And then there is the coordinated entry project, which then uh, uh, by entering them in the coordinated entry project, there's additional information, there are dis uh, I'm sorry, additional um, information on vulnerability and risk. And that then puts somebody into the overall prioritization list that the COC uses to identify those who uh, are um, going to be referred for the next available project, whether it's permanent supportive housing or rapid rehousing. So within that 14 day period or some version of it, um, we are gonna continue to focus on what alternatives may exist, look for areas where there could be self-resolution, reconnection with family and friends, mediation with landlords, Maybe the landlord uh, told them they were kicked out, but they really weren't, and they still have tenancy rights, and we have to mediate that a little bit, get them back into the unit, and then reconnect back to legal services. There's all these different variations of ways in which we can support people without giving them 
uh, necessarily an enrollment in the homeless uh, services that again are finite. So um, uh, those two HMIS distinctions are important uh, for folks to understand, uh, but you're also gonna be entering interim updates in coordinated entry projects. Uh, anytime information is uh, missing or updated, uh, that would happen at the minimum every 90 days while folks are still actively homeless. Uh, making sure that uh, information that may be false, so they could have indicated they are a veteran, but uh, uh, that's not true, so you have to correct that. Um, and making sure that if there are any transfers from one region or regional access point geography to another, that that's being uh, communicated with the court entry leads. Uh, and folks are then exited if they are uh, no longer uh, uh, found after 90 days. We create sort of a 90-day structure to say, if we have, if we are actively looking for and have yet to be able to relocate or find uh, Doug, who we saw 91 days ago, we assume that Doug is either being picked up in another region and or Doug has self-resolved uh, his homelessness or he moved to Florida or he won the lottery, whatever it may be. Uh, from an HMIS point of view, we're going to exit that client uh, and consider them not to be part uh, of our total universe until uh, and, and, and if they, they reemerge later. Um, so these HMIS requirements fall in line with uh, the effort to uh, connect with people, look for those alternatives, begin to understand what their real needs are, begin to understand what their desires and goals are, and then escalate, progressively escalate our assessment process to collect more information over time that then put somebody toward the prioritization list. As a point of um, clarity for folks where a lot of what I'm talking about is jargon, just because a, uh, a household hits the 14 day trigger, uh, gets assessed and, and gets put in court entry is now on the prioritization list is not in any way a guarantee that that individual or household will then be connected to a dedicated homeless resource. So um, uh, we have a whole universe of folks that need assistance a subset of that universe, uh, typically a large subset of it, goes into what we call our prioritization list in this in this vocabulary, which means they're part of the overall assessment process. Uh, but then a much smaller group of that total universe is going to actually have a permanent supportive housing or rapid rehousing slot made available to them, or a choice voucher or something like that that's facilitated through coordinated entry. So just because someone's on the prioritization list does not mean our effort to help them navigate towards some other alternative uh, goes away. Uh, and in fact, the more people we can help navigate toward other alternatives, the more opportunity we have to make sure that the people that we are linking to the finite resources we do have are the ones who need it most and are at higher risk, highest risk of not uh, exiting homelessness on their own. So uh, this 14 day window does not mean we just stop and say, OK, you're on the housing list, uh, sit tight for a little while and somebody will call you with your housing voucher. That is not uh, going to happen. Um, and if uh, 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 and we have to make sure that we're communicating to clients that when they're going to be linked to a housing resource is unknown, uh, because again, uh, we are triaging broken arms and head trauma. So if someone even is um, uh, poised to go toward PSH in the next month or two, but then we have more people with head trauma come in and those folks need that uh, intervention more quickly than that person who may have been uh, coming up toward a referral that might change. It can change in real time. It can change in a day's notice. So we are not creating a numerical chronological, uh, chronological list of folks for when they're gonna get their housing. We need to make sure that uh, clients understand that there is no guarantee they're gonna be linked to housing in the near term. And that anything that you all as assessment partners can do and they can do uh, in an empowered way uh, to help resolve their homelessness or find alternatives is gonna be important until essentially the day that they are referred into uh, some sort of housing intervention and frankly accept that housing intervention based on whatever conditions exist, whether where it is, what the expectations of the project are and whatnot. So this uh, assessment partner role is, is uh, uh, primarily uh, an engagement partner role, right? It is understanding the needs and desires of clients working to contribute the data needed for the system to understand those needs and desires and supporting clients and trying to resolve uh, the worst day and month and week of their life as quickly as we can, even knowing we may not have a dedicated resource to provide to them. So those are our assessment roles. Stephanie, is there anything that I should pause for or should I continue? I just want to uh, say really quickly, um, everybody, who's currently part of our formal system is either a referral partner or an assessment partner. And what we're getting into now is kind of 
some of the deeper details for our assessment partner folks. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that we found it important to include some of the HMIS requirements just so everybody in our system has an understanding for what is being expected of each role, but we will get more into the specifics on all the assessment staff and all of the um, other requirements as we move forward in this. If you have any really urgent concerns or questions as you're looking at what these are and you're saying, hey, I'm an assessment partner and I'm not sure about this or that, um, you're welcome to ask us here, but I would also encourage you to reach out to whoever it is that oversees your funds that make you um, an assessment partner. So I think we mentioned today, we mentioned at the last training, assessment partners are all of our required partners. That means your, your funding source is requiring you to participate in this process. So if you have any big questions, please uh, take it back to whoever it is that is overseeing the funds you receive that make you required as an assessment partner. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Stephanie. So two on one. Um, uh, so New Hampshire two on one is, uh, as many of you know, and it's probably you know I go back to you know if I knocked on ten of my neighbors' doors, uh, how many would know what to do if they suddenly lost their housing or became homeless or had a health crisis and you know were evicted or whatnot. Um, uh, I, I think two on one is probably the uh, vocabulary that the most folks in New Hampshire who have not been experiencing housing instability in the past know about. Um, but this is the main entry into our court entry process, particularly while well, it's phone-based entry into the court entry system. It's a 24-7 uh, referral for housing needs. Um, and one important feature of 211 is that staff are conducting that prevention and diversion assessment tool, which is a, a physical tool that exists, uh, but also requires really important skill sets in trying to understand uh, where folks are at, what the most appropriate um, resource is, where the regional access point is going to be for them to follow up. So that 211 is our triage uh, entity in many ways in terms of understanding where somebody is, what their crisis is, uh, and then being able to connect them in this, in this sense to a regional access point that can continue to follow up. So 211 is uh, a crisis line. So we are trying to make sure that the housing uh, crisis is resolved in the moment, uh, making sure that if somebody is fleeing domestic violence or has been abused, that there's a safe place for them to go, connecting someone to emergency shelter or another provider. If it's a veteran, our SSVF community has a hotel motel, making sure that we have a, a basic capture of what the crisis at hand is and are getting folks connected with a longer term process of uh, our, our uh, regional access points and our assessment partners moving forward. Um, one, one also has a broader picture in terms of being able to connect people to uh, resources that may be for people who are in poverty or are lower income that may not be necessarily for uh, literal homelessness or risk of homelessness like welfare systems, child welfare systems, um, uh, emergency responders and things like that. So what the expectation for our 211 partners is, is that they are uh, using that diversion assessment tool uh, employing those housing problem solving strategies in a light touch manner generally with an initial context uh, where clients are seeking support, providing the caller with a list of local resources that may include emergency shelter. <clears throat> I believe in some <clears throat> cases, uh, make a judgment call on whether any sort of emergency services are necessary. And then having that referral made to the local regional access point, which becomes sort of our centralized manager of uh, these, these folks that are seeking assistance um, that can't be immediately diverted where the crisis is clearly housing related and now we're sending that uh, client or that household uh, uh, information or, or giving them information on how to access the broader kind of homeless crisis response system. So our 211 um, uh, folks will enter clients into that referral to court entry project. So when you see the word referral, that means we're capturing the full universe of engagement touch points for people in crisis. Um, it does not suggest that they are doing long form assessment. They are uh, trying to make sure that there's no dangerous, uh, urgent uh, situation that needs to be resolved uh, uh, immediately where there is an urgent situation or somebody's calling uh, with uh, that's fallen into homelessness or is about to be that they are then uh, triaging that information to the regional access points and that they're providing that basic data uh, entry into HMIS so that now we've included 
uh, that household as uh, as somebody within our total universe um, of uh, folks who are experiencing housing instability or homelessness in the community. So two on one plays a critical role in particular because it's accessible um, uh, geographically to anybody in the state. The limiting factor is that folks uh, may need a phone, but um, where our regional access points and assessment partners tend to be uh, congregated in certain areas, our outreach teams are working hard out throughout the community, but have limited capacity and staffing. Two on one becomes that centralized spot for anybody uh, in the state to call and at least get a base level of resource connection and base level of uh, understanding of who they are and what their needs are and then moving them into um, that next step in the process. So our two on one system acts there uh, and often linking to uh, our regional access points. And here are, uh, I think it is nine of them or so, the regional access points uh, throughout the state. Uh, if you are a regional access point, I think you would know that, uh, that you tend to be the larger organizations in some of the, some of the areas here listed. Uh, and you play uh, some really uh, important roles. Um, you're the point of entry for people who are experiencing homelessness coming in from 211 or who are referred directly through into an access point. Uh, that may include in-person and walk-in or virtual support. That includes that diversion housing system navigation assessment. Uh, I think uh, all of the uh, RAPs are also assessment partners. Uh, you're looking to match openings uh, with, your, with local prioritization policies. Uh, one thing that is unique in New Hampshire is because we are, especially the balance of state is statewide, we, we have different geographies. <clears throat> so if you live in the Keene area, the types of resources and local uh, connections that are available look different than in Manchester or Portsmouth or Wolfboro or uh, you know, up in the North Country or, or wherever it might be. And so uh, you have that local uh, knowledge and, and coordination of services within your local community that may include internal and external case conferencing. Um, in terms of timeframes, uh, what the expectation is as individuals are referred from 211, that there's follow up within 24 hours of receiving that referral. And, they, and that you're following along the similar time frames for the diversion conversations and then the longer assessment and, and HMIS data entry that our assessment partners are doing. So you as a wrap or a subset of our assessment partner group, our assessment partner group is a wider net of organizations and entities that are able to do assessment to get those folks into the system to work on these diversion efforts. Uh, the wraps are a centralized place where 211 is going to be able to uh, refer into or provide information regarding, and then other folks may walk in. Some of the organizations on the list are clearly our local shelter system, are clearly the primary service providers that homeless folks are engaging with within the community. And so you're performing a lot of the same tasks that the assessment partners are performing, but also uh, uh, having that point of entry uh, for 211 or other folks who may need uh, a referral uh, within a community that the regional access point becomes kind of a centralized uh, space for that. In order to access our regional access points, we also uh, have our, our outreach partners. Um, many of you or some of you on the phone may do outreach in the community as, small, as part of your program. Uh, maybe you run a small community-based program where you are doing outreach and connecting with folks uh, who are living outside or in their cars or in places not meant for human habitation. As far as the formal list of outreach partners that's listed here, uh, you can see them across the state, uh, but really um, anybody who's doing outreach should be part of this uh, consortium of groups that are, that are proactive. And I would suggest, uh, and this isn't part of the slide, that our outreach teams are uh, mapping what your outreach activities are, are doing, where they're doing those activities, and for whom. What groups are you looking to identify in your outreach strategy so that we can best streamline uh, and not duplicate our services. Uh, one of the um, uh, things that I see in communities across the country that has the most uh, duplication of effort is outreach, where there are outreach providers from different funded programs that are all in the same space, not sharing information. And I'm not suggesting that's happening in New Hampshire, but it's always something I suggest is that uh, literally, I think uh, the 15 folks on this list here should virtually or in person get in a room with a map of the state of New Hampshire and figure out where they are, when they're there, and who they're looking for to make sure that we can be as efficient as possible, share that information as easily as possible so that we can uh, maximize the limited staffing and capacity we have for our outreach activities. 
So our outreach providers are, uh, from, from this perspective, in terms of the formal system, are receiving emergency solution grant or PATH funding. Many of you are, and if you are, you must participate in that assessment partner uh, system and utilize that court entry system. Um, you will be entering folks into the court entry project in HMIS at the time of uh, entry into either ESG or PATH. Uh, you also are expected to follow households that are entered into court and entry at least weekly. So you can see there's a lot of similarities here uh, from our outreach team uh, going toward our assessment providers, right? So our assessment partners are the broadest group that we have within that assessment partnership group. There are the regional access points that are sort of centralized location that we have our outreach partners who are physically out in the community engaging with people who are living outside or are uh, touching uh, spaces outside of sort of central service areas. And uh, the same timeframes around diversion and assessment and, and completing HMIS data requirements are important here. Again, as we go through this, um, a reminder to all of you who are not listed on these slides, the, uh, the continuums encourage and uh, really do want you to participate in these processes. And if you're looking at the different, um, sorry, the different expectations across these, so if you do outreach and you are not connected to the system, it's part of a, a mission-driven organization that you are working for uh, and, uh, uh, and you sort of do it on your own, um, the states and the COCs uh, really want to work with any provider who has some capacity to participate in this, even if you don't have the full capacity necessary to meet every expectation laid out here, particularly if you're not funded by HUD and you're not technically obligated to participate, it doesn't mean that you uh, shouldn't from a philosophical and, and sort of system planning point of view, but also that if your limited capacity is the concern that you have, making sure you communicate that with the COC leads or your, and, and your, your counterparts locally to figure out what, where can you fit in? How can some of your capacity issues around HMIS or assessment be relieved by say the regional access points or other places within the system. So you can still do the great work that you do as a mission-driven organization, but not necessarily, and, and, and still be able to participate in coordinated entry uh, and balance those two priorities that you may have uh, while being part of this system. So our outreach providers play a really critical role. Uh, I just wanna shout out to, I think all of us and all of you in particular uh, are, have some of the hardest jobs in the world. And, and I just really have to give kudos to the outreach providers on the line who are uh, really outside, you know, we're coming into mid-December right now. This is a really difficult uh, time of year. It's a really difficult job. And um, and I personally, as somebody from New Hampshire who is not a direct service provider, appreciate uh, your hard work. And I think it's always worth um, uh, elevating our outreach providers because I think it's one of the hardest jobs in the world. So uh, we also have our emergency uh, shelter system, right? Um, okay, I'll take a sip of my water here. So these are the primary emergency housing or emergency shelter providers across the state. Um, some of you may provide, again, this is another opportunity for small or faith-based or mission-driven organizations that are not formally part of this to engage with your continuum of care to figure out how your emergency response and services are able to fit into this system. How can the clients or the people that you are serving be referred into the more formal process that might lead them to a, um, a housing intervention? How can the system understand when you have availability to put somebody into an emergency housing or emergency shelter uh, bed if there's no other place for them to go and you have room? How do we make that work together? Uh, but these are uh, the primary shelter providers. So um, there are certain agencies and you, and you know of yourselves that must participate uh, as a uh, uh, provider within the court entry system. Uh, shelter guests, are uh, required to be entered into HMIS, uh, the HMIS court entry project by shelter staff. Um, shelters need to inform 211 of any updates to how your shelter is func uh, functioning and refer referring. So we wanna make sure that 211 knows who can and cannot go to your shelter uh, or uh, uh, where you're at capacity or have further capacity to take more people in. We know capacity is very limited right now. Uh, I know in our area, they're gonna be opening a warming center, um, but it's important for 211 to understand that because the worst thing that we can do to people in a housing crisis is, is give them information that's incorrect. And so if 211 thinks that the shelter down the street is open, 
but you closed or has space, but you don't, or allows uh, people with pets, but you don't, um, then they need to know that. They need to understand the restrictions and the caveats of how and when you receive referrals so that they're not providing false information to people and sending people on wild goose chases who are already, uh, again, in the worst day, week, or month of their life. So um, shelters are not required to fill openings through the prioritization list. Court entry is about understanding the finite resources on the back end. Um, but we do want to make sure that where capacity allows, that we're continuing to provide those diversion services. Most of you are also assessment partners, uh, continuing to look for other local resources that may be available to people. And you would be part of that court entry partnership agreement. And again, going back to important timeframes and HMIS data requirements, we're, we're still within this larger universe of our assessment partners. Um, your shelter providers are also doing those diversion and problem solving conversations. You're also going to be uh, doing the uh, formal assessment that puts somebody onto the prioritization list. And again, that prioritization list not meaning that that person, that household is going to receive any sort of housing service, uh, but that they would be, be on the list uh, uh, to examine their vulnerability as compared to others in the community to figure out who gets that next. Um, shelter providers, I would encourage to be exceptionally transparent uh, with 211 and your community partners about uh, what you do and do not allow and how you allow people to come in. I would also encourage, because I have the soapbox for the minute, that if you are an emergency shelter provider that does not, uh, that creates barriers for people to come in, uh, whether it be that they have to show, um, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, that they have um, mental health treatment or that they can't be under any form of substance use or that, you know, they can't have a criminal history if they, they have to pay fees to you. Um, uh, we have to remember that emergency shelter is the last uh, option for people and that the people who end up in emergency shelter are often the people for whom other systems said no and our system needs to say yes and bring people in. So we won't uh, dive too much into emergency shelter today, but I'm always a bit disappointed uh, in other communities, probably not New Hampshire, with how emergency shelters uh, have become uh, 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 a really difficult housing niche that screen more people out than in in the hardest days of their lives, especially in the winter. So I, with my soapbox, I will say that I think we have to completely lower the barriers to shelter to the point where we can do so safely and uh, get back to the roots of providing uh, what is the most basic of human rights services that we can, uh, even to folks that uh, may be challenging to work with as long as they can be safe in that environment. Uh, so finally, um, we need to house some people, right? So we've talked a lot about assessing them and, and doing these other things. Um, we also need to house folks uh, in the community with the limited resources we have. So here are our formal housing partners uh, that you can see. Again, these slides will go out uh, and we'll have an opportunity to take a look at them together. But these are the partners who are operating uh, or at least formally operating within the system are permanent housing resources, whether it be permanent supportive housing, Papua, rapid rehousing, ESG, things like that. Uh, some of them may be specific to veterans or specific to youth or specific to families or specific to individuals, but these are our housing partners. And these are the folks that are receiving those referrals uh, from uh, coordinated entry from that prioritiz prioritization list to fill open vacancies with eligible clients. So the whole process that happens prior to this about trying to find alternatives about making sure people know where they can go for emergency support uh, to uh, doing longer form assessment to understand people's needs, vulnerabilities, and glide path options out of homelessness to the triage function, trying to make a distinction between broken arms and head trauma uh, results in us coming up with a, a, a small group of individuals on an ongoing basis for whom uh, when a housing unit or uh, uh, opening uh, becomes available, whether that be an enrollment, say in rapid rehousing, where they're enrolled prior to their housing placement, or permanent supportive housing, where there's uh, a more of a rapid connection to the unit, uh, you are pulling from that prioritization list. So if you are a housing provider and you are only providing housing to the people within your organization because you also run the shelter or the, or the, or the food pantry or whatnot, then that is not consistent with what we're trying to achieve with coordinated entry. Because again, it's not about my client, it's about our client. So just because you may have folks who you're serving in other capacities or interacting with who seem vulnerable uh, and make and really do need the housing, provider across the street or across the town or one town over, maybe working with somebody who's in exceptionally greater dire straits and needs that 
uh, 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 housing <coughs> uh, more quickly or um, has higher vulnerability. So um, our prioritization list is a community list of individuals and households for whom we've identified needing, needing the most and most immediate support for housing interventions. And as a housing provider, you are required to pull from that list. And that means if you're doing permanent supportive housing, you need to be prepared to take the hardest clients that exist within our community or the clients for whom we have yet to understand how to serve best within our community. There should not be a denial of services for permanent supportive housing. If you um, uh, are a PSH provider, you have opted into serving the, those clients with the highest vulnerability and most significant housing barriers, uh, including uh, uh, physical disabilities, mental health, substance use, uh, criminal backgrounds, low income to no income, that is your job. Similarly, for rapid rehousing, if you are a rapid rehousing provider, you need to make sure you're operating with the greatest flexibility that the federal government and the state governments allow you to operate your projects to meet the needs of highly vulnerable people for whom PSH is not available. Rapid rehousing is not a one month program or two month program where you give a security deposit, print off some Craigslist ads and pay two months of a rental assistance. What we have to continue to do is make sure that our housing programs are meeting the needs of the, of the individual uh, households in our community. So uh, again, this is soapbox, but from the housing provider point of view, really understanding how much flexibility you have within your program and what your program is specifically designed to do. COC programs are designed to meet the needs of the most vulnerable people in the, in the community. ESG is the same way, HOPWA for a specialized population. If you are denying services to folks because they are too, quote unquote, high barrier, uh, uh, or they have too many problems or they're too vulnerable or too hard to serve, then this may not be the role that you uh, meant to sign up for. Uh, and I don't mean to say that uh, uh, in a mean way, but uh, across the country, again, never in New Hampshire, we hear of PSH providers who say, I can't serve this person because they have a criminal history. Well, I'm sorry, you signed up to serve that person specifically because they have a criminal history, specifically because they have substance use issues that lead them to housing instability, specifically because they have unmet uh, and untreated mental health needs that they don't wanna get treated right now. And your job is gonna be help stabilize them within that context. So. That is the soapbox on our housing providers and the fact that we have a lot of people in the state of New Hampshire that are probably easy to serve and we need to make sure we're focusing uh, likely on those folks who we, we might frame as hardest to serve and I would frame as those who we have yet to discover the best way to serve. Uh, important time frames. Um, we need to make sure if we're going to link people to your housing resources that the core entry process knows that you have openings. Um, you should be able to <clears throat> let the court entry lead know, uh, and I apologize for my cold, by the way, I know it's loud when I cough in the, in the headphones, um, provider list of openings to court entry on a weekly basis. And I would suggest if you know somebody is going to be uh, leaving their housing or that a unit is going to be opening up in the near term, to let them know as far in advance as possible, because that gives them the court entry lead, uh, their knowledge, they need to anticipate what might be available, not just tomorrow, but in the coming weeks. Um, uh, also making sure that those referrals, once that referral is made to you, uh, that you are then taking on some level of responsibility and connecting to the individual or household, uh, maybe through the, the referring partner or the assessment partner that they originated from, to try to bring them, screen them into your program, uh, and to follow up uh, uh, with the outcome of that outreach and referral within 24 hours. So in HMIS, uh, you're going to update that court entry referral to indicate uh, the outcome that they that they've been referred and then you would exit the client from the coordinated entry project because now you are entering them into your housing project so for those of you who don't use hmis the core entry project is separate from a given project or program housing program so once somebody is becoming housed they are exited from coordinated entry they no longer exist within the community uh, the universe in our data set they are now going to housing program of important note just because somebody is exited from HMIS court entry project doesn't mean they're necessarily exited from the larger systems effort to ensure their housing resource is available. So for instance, uh, we saw this with some of the extra vouchers. We know this exists in the veteran community. You may have folks that go into rapid rehousing that really would have been better off uh, going into permanent supportive housing. Permanent supportive housing wasn't immediately available. So we house them with rapid rehousing. In rapid rehousing, they maintain their eligibility to transfer to permanent supportive housing. 
And therefore, you may have folks that uh, were housed with rapid rehousing who have high levels of vulnerability, who need the more intensive permanent uh, services that PSH brings along. And you may need to bring the case conferencing or communicate the need to transfer somebody from your rapid rehousing project into uh, a permanent supportive housing project, whether it be COC or even VA funded. Folks exiting HMIS coordinate entry project does not then preclude them from going through a discussion within case conferencing, within the prioritization policy that allows for those transfers to happen. I know there's been some um, uh, effort around these transfers with some of the emergency housing vouchers or some specialized vouchers that came out last year. I know my VA friends on the phone and SSVF friends on the phone have done this for quite a while where they're able to house people with SSVF and they continue to look to see if HUD bash might be available. So just because someone is exiting out of HMIS uh, in the court entry project does not then mean the system has now deserted them. Uh, should their needs change or increase or shift uh, while they're housed in uh, one project, that shift in need or that, uh, that um, requirement of trying to explore other long-term options uh, can still be in place. Uh, it just doesn't exist inside that core entry project. And the same goes for folks that uh, may go into rapid rehousing or even PSH and you're trying to get them referred into public housing. Maybe they don't need the services, they just need the affordability. But just because someone is, is leaving the court entry project in HMIS does not mean uh, the system has forgotten them or you as a housing provider. It just means that they're no longer part of our universe of actively homeless people within the state of New Hampshire or within your community. So that was a lot. And I see the chat's been kind of lighting up a bit here. I wanted to leave at least 10 minutes. And it looks like I left 11, which is impressive for me because I talk a lot to see if there are questions, uh, clarifications uh, that have come up, Stephanie, in the chat or other folks on the line uh, from COT leadership or the court entry committees that would like to chime in. And I will pause and take a sip of water while you let me know there, Stephanie. Thank you, Doug. Um, I did just want to highlight if you are interested, uh, you know, the chat has me thinking if you're really committed and interested um, in being part of how all of these policies and procedures are developed, um, what we're doing with assessment, you know, if you want to have your voice at the table as we continue developing all these things, because mind you, coordinated entry, it's, it's not a a one and done thing. Our system is always looking to improve. We're always looking for feedback, how we can make this better, because again, the goal is to prioritize, help prioritize those who are most vulnerable um, in our system. So we definitely need to hear from all of you on that. So if that's something you're interested in, all three COCs have coordinated entry committees that meet to discuss these items um, and are the leads in each uh, COC for you know, making these decisions and policies and all that. So I think most of you on the call are already uh, quite involved, but if you're not, please um, feel free to send me an email. I'm happy to direct you to uh, how to get in touch and involved in that stuff. Um, I think most of the questions and comments in the chat have been addressed um, through the, the presentation in the chat, uh, two on one, thank you again for, for all the support. Um, helpful to see you in the chat as well. Let's see. The last question here from Jim, if people in coordinated entry are housed and then they become homeless again, do they stay at the top of the prioritization list? So as Doug kind of mentioned earlier, that list is not the same uh, day to day. That list is changing every day, um, you know, based on who's coming in, who's coming out. So um, there's no, you know, nobody is staying at the top of the list per se, uh, regardless of <laughs> what the situation is. It's pretty uh, fluid. It's, a, it's always kind of moving depending on what's going on in the community, what's getting entered in for data and all of that. I'll add to that wanna, really quick. Yeah. Um, so a couple of things on that for folks who become homeless again. Uh, one thing that we did not talk about in this training, uh, but we part of, I think, future conversations, and we actually did a training a year or two ago, is around case conferencing one, where, uh, you know, we look to build in uh, some uh, sort of transparent process that allows folks to communicate needs that are not captured within the formal assessment process uh, to the court entry kind of team or, or group uh, that allows sort of a complement or I'm sorry, supplementary information that might, uh, that might uh, warrant somebody being um, prioritized 
uh, uh, that might not look the same on paper. I think we're still working on kind of what does that look like, you know, more formally. I think that's happening probably in many of your local areas already. Um, but that idea of case conferencing. The other piece is one of uh, one of the only uh, predictors of homelessness um, is whether someone has been homeless before. Um, and actually, when we do prevention work, that is one of the heavily weighted predictors uh, around, you know, who is not just going to lose their housing or get evicted, but who's actually become literally homeless. One of the only research driven predictors is a, a number of them, but one of the primary ones is who's been homeless before. So as we think about the new assessment tool process and a new assessment process that's sort of being developed now, and we'll talk more in training, um, that idea of elevating folks uh, or weighting vulnerability based on uh, a recent experience of homelessness or recent um, or uh, 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 um, re-entry into homelessness is something we can certainly take a look into uh, because uh, poverty does not predict homelessness. There's lots of folks in poverty that don't become homeless. There's alcoholism, you know, plenty of alcoholics in housing, you know, mental health, there's plenty of people with mental health issues in housing. Um, but whether someone's been homeless before in the past actually has statistically, um, uh, uh, it, statistically, it, it's a better predictor of whether someone will be homeless again. So when we see people recidivate from program to program and not be able to keep their housing, it is a case conferencing issue. It is a prioritization issue that we'll hopefully be able to address a little bit better in some of the assessment tools. And I think it's also a communication issue amongst the housing providers, like what happened, right? So uh, there should never be an exit from permanent supportive housing. Uh, there could be an eviction, but they shouldn't be exiting from the project. They should be rehoused somewhere else and provided some different level of service. So where folks become homeless again, um, another element to that is what didn't work last time and how can we better support their housing stability within the, the, the sort of context of their specific vulnerabilities moving forward. So really important point, Jim, I don't think it's sort of fully resolved at the moment, but certainly something uh, that we, we can keep an eye on as we kind of continue to build this out. Doug, that's everything we have in the chat left. Let's see. There's one last question, I think, on HMIS there, Stephanie, that just came in. As a referral morning. partner, how do we ensure our clients have been enrolled in coordinated entry? All of this system is uh, big on communication. <laughs> so where referral partners um, aren't necessarily, they could have HMIS access, but they're, they're not doing the assessments. Um, and it's really those assessment partners and the regional access points doing it. Uh, it would be to communicate with whoever that is that you need the referral to. Um, two and one is making sure that people are getting referred to the regional access points. I haven't heard of any issues so far, but we're always open ears. Uh, I believe all the regional access points are doing a really great job at following up on those referrals from two and one. So. Um, you know, if you do make a referral to 2 and one you can be ensured that they're being referred to the regional access point. And as Freeman mentioned in the chat, you can reach out to your um, regional access point. I can include an email that goes out with the slides and the link for today's training, uh, what we currently have for the list of regional access points. That will give you what the walk-in hours are and places um, and let you know who those folks are that are responding to the um, 2 and one calls and if you're a referral partner and you're not sure who to send a referral to, um, connect with me after the training and you can make sure, but this is still all part of the process that we're trying to build and um, really get you know, up and running pretty well. So we'd like to have some more uh, discussion on how we formalize the process for, for referral partners to get their clients integrated directly. Yeah, and to just to add to that, Stephanie, uh, you know, at least for, at Belknap Merrimack Community Action, we are currently the regional access point partner for that area. So like, honestly, we're just trying to make it as easy as possible. And like she said, as this gets formula formalized, uh, it'll be easier because we'll all just know exactly what we should do and when. But until then, please just reach out, at least if you're in my two counties, or even if not, please just reach out to us. And uh, I I'm sure I can say for other organizations that we're all healthy, happy to help you connect with the right place to get it done for your client, because that's what it's all about. Um, so feel free to reach out to us. And two and one is a pretty easy number to remember. So if you do have someone yep. that needs to be connected, that there is a no wrong way you can go with doing the two and one referral. They've been an amazing partner, really good at getting these housing referrals out. Yep, they're rock stars. They get them over to us, and uh, we couldn't do it without them. So 
Thanks, John, Elena. Okay. I'm not seeing anything else in the chat that has not been addressed yet. Looking at the time, it's 2.27, just a couple minutes left. Uh, just a reminder, if there's any final questions, we have two minutes, but uh, we will send the recording um, out of this presentation as well as the slides. Uh, and I think uh, to Freeman and Stephanie's most recent points here, you know, communication is key. Uh, we've got bullet points and whatnot here trying to create kind of a, a more formal and clear way in which we now help people navigate towards services. But we're not a huge state. Um, we A lot of us know each other, right? And so, um, you know, communicating with your local partners, asking those questions of the continuum of care leads and court entry leads um, uh, can only help. Um, and, 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 and creating feedback loops to make sure that uh, uh, what's being put in place is going to best meet the needs of the community. Um, you know, we're small but mighty here in New Hampshire. I think there's a lot of good opportunity with everyone here on the line uh, to really continue to enhance the services that are already in place and, and, and look for ways that we can work with each other uh, uh, most effectively on behalf of and with the people who are in a housing crisis and need to be, uh, need to be supported. So, um, you know, many thanks to everybody, but, you know, keep up that communication because it's incredibly valuable. Anything else, Stephanie, before we close out? Just wanted to uh, remind everyone that our next screening is going to be focused on access and assessment. It's currently scheduled for Monday, January 10th, 1 to 2.30. If there are changes uh, to the schedule for some reason, we will communicate that with you. But currently, that is what we're looking at. Uh, I will also include, as usual, in my email, the list of the upcoming trainings we have scheduled. We really appreciate everyone participating and coming, asking us questions, and it's been really great so far. So we look forward to continuing the series. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Stephanie, for uh, organizing this, and Freeman for uh, bringing your thoughts in here as well and helping out with this presentation. Uh, for the rest of you, uh, happy Monday. Uh, if we don't see you or talk with you, or at least for me, I hope you have a great holiday season. Happy New Year. Stay safe and healthy. And we'll all be talking again uh, in the future. Thank you very much.